Okay, so our welcome everyone for learning talks. This is my favorite part of the conference, let's say. So our first one is Chuck. And well, someone is sharing to... the screen, which is not mine. Yeah. <laughs> Who's doing that? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's, it's your screen now. Okay, uh, okay, now, now I can share. Okay. <laughs> right. So your time is starting, you have five minutes. Right, so hello, uh, I'm Czech. So uh, I, I hope I have met some of you like uh, in person previously in the previous uh, Europe events. So uh, today, this is uh, my live stream talk. And uh, if you want to grab the slides, I always put the link of the slides at the top of the first slide. And also my contact detail like in my first slides as well. So um, uh, please like, uh, you can ask me questions. That's fine. You can contact me through like, um, Twitter uh, or just tag me in the conference is fine. Um, so this is about teaching in uh, in Africa. So um, this is actually what I did last year, early last year, uh, that is in Pycon Namibia. I went and attended and also I, uh, you know, together with me, I have this friend, Sandrine, some of them, uh, some of you may have met her. Uh, we have give a, a data science workshop in Python there. And I can tell you the experience is amazing. The people there love learning Python. They're so enthusiastic. And that's why I think it's a really good thing. And that's why I want to tell you about that. So uh, the plan was that uh, we gone, going to, is people seeing my screen all right? Uh, yeah, okay. So yeah, sorry, I see your message. But anyway, like uh, we want to do it in uh, PyCon Africa uh, this year. Uh, we want to, you know, expand not just in Namibia, but maybe in PyCon Africa, which, which was, was planned to happen in Ghana. Uh, well, uh, it, it didn't happen <laughs> because of COVID-19. That's why we are all sitting here at home now. And, um, well, fine, let's do it online then, you know, it was just like taping away, like just, you know, I don't care, I have to make it happen. And um, but actually, um, it's, it's not that difficult because we figured it out. We have actually already done it in PyCon US this year. Like it's an online workshop, it's about data science for absolute beginners. And uh, we had like, it was break into two days, uh, we, it's two Saturday and people learned uh, you know, very like very very beginner topic about you know how to use pandas, how to use uh, you know uh, scikit-learn, and some some of them don't even know Python, and we have to teach them like very very basic Python. So um, so this is uh, what we we have done uh, in May this year in uh, in PyCon US, and um, but you know uh, we are now like you know two weeks away from PyCon Africa, so it. The, the, the workshop this year in PyCon Africa will be on the 9th uh, of uh, you know August, and um, we really really need people to participate. So uh, there is this this link here, and uh, you can also follow us on Twitter. We just have this uh, brand set up, so uh, so things could be a little bit still like a little bit empty, but it's 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 there. So we what we want you to contribute is that you know of course like if you know some like data science stuff you know join to be mentors uh, we need a lot of mentors to make this happen we plan to have as much participant as we can accommodate uh, online and of course if you know anybody who want to you know learn python or who want to maybe like learn how to do data science with python you know share the link to them uh, the, the the application is closing on the second so uh, please do it quickly and the last thing that i want to tell you uh, i've like around like one minute a little bit more to, to to say is that did you enjoy the conference uh i think you can just like raise your hand but i won't be able to see it <laughs> because you're at home but i hope you enjoy the conference if you want more uh there's party the global happening in november this year cfp closes on the second as well so uh please act quickly uh, the link is there and also i'm also organizing another conference at the end of the year 5th of december it will be 24 hours it will be around the globe. Uh, it will be, we will be all wearing pajamas. And because it's called pajamas con, okay? So we are all going to wear pajamas. And the CFP is going to open on the third. So when you finish your PyData Global, you can like submit the same talk or submit some other talks uh, to pajamas con. And it closes on the fifth. And we also need a lot of help from uh, Asia Pacific uh, because 
now all the organizers are mainly in Europe or in America. So we need someone from uh, Asia Pacific to help. So please contact me. Uh, my contact details at the beginning of the slides, I can roll back if I have time. Uh, the website is pajamas.life. So um, I will go back to the first slide so you can contact me. So please get in touch if you want to join the workshop or join Pajamas Con or submit to um, Padilla Global. We need your help. And that's it from me. And I hope you enjoy the rest of Europe Python. <laughs> so thank you, Chet. Thank you. So next one is Ben. Ben is going to talk about PyWheels. So for, for you to know, if you see the in if I don't know if you're seeing the, the Zoom, but there is a in the Euro Python Society, you can see that there is a timer if that's useful for you. Otherwise, I, I would interrupt you. That's okay. Okay, can you see my slides okay? Yes, yep. I do. Yeah, great. Okay. So, uh, quick intro. Uh, I'm Ben. I'm, I'm a software engineer at BBC. I used to work at the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, so, why Pi Wheels? So, before Pi Wheels existed, pip install on a Raspberry Pi would take ages. Uh, people don't generally build ARM platform wheels, just x86 and variations for Linux, Mac, and Windows. Um, so, I wondered if it would be possible to build a repository to host ARM platform wheels. Uh, it turns out it is, uh, so I did. Uh, so just a bit of background. So uh, if you're uploading a pure Python package to PyPy, uh, the main Python package index, you generally uh, create a source distribution, which is usually a tarball or a zip uh, containing the, the, the source the, um, uh, of, of, your, of your project, and you upload a universal Python wheel, uh, a, a wheel file. Uh, but if you're um, if you have C extensions uh, or co any compiled extensions in your in your in your package, you have to compile it, uh, and it has to be compiled for every version of Python you support, every every minor version, and every operating system, and every combination of those. So you might end up with something like this, you know, depending on the number of versions and platforms you support, and then your source distribution as well. Um, and so what would happen would be that uh, a Raspberry Pi user would get um, would you know hit all of these platform wheels and none of them would match. So they'd get the source tarball or zip and they'd, it, it, their pip would have to start doing the build uh, the, themselves. So uh, it would take, that's why it take, take a long time. So PyWheels is an open source project uh, maintained by myself and my friend Dave Jones. Uh, it's kind of the tooling to automate building wheels of everything on PyPy and then, um, and it kind of, it, but it's targeted towards the ARM platform. I mean, you, you could tweak it to, to work for other platforms. Um, uh, or other um, other hardware platforms, but um, it's obviously made for the Raspberry Pi. So you end up with uh, wheels tagged with Linux ARM v6 L and Linux Linux ARM v7 L. Uh, PyWheels.org is the equivalent of PyPy.org for for PyWheels. So it's the website, the repository like PyPy um, that hosts all the ARM wheels that we've built. Uh, the website comprises of uh, the simple index, which is what pip uses to navigate your files and find uh, suitable distributions to, to use, uh, and project pages like PyPy does, so you can browse the human readable HTML and look at, look at different projects and what's available and which, which packages and which versions of, of, uh, have builds and have wheels. And then um, you know some additional info pages and a blog and things like that. That's what's on pywheels.org. And so compared to what I showed you earlier, PyWheels provides uh, wheels for Python 3.4, 3.5, and 3.7 for Linux on v6 and v7. Uh, on v6 and on, on v7 um, compiled platform wheels um, it, it's these Python versions because they are what comes with the um, the Raspbian version the Debian version that uh, that Raspberry Pi uses so Debian Jesse stretch and Buster uh, have these three Python versions in them and we just support support those um, so a lot of people assume we cross compile the uh, um, the wheels for, for speed, but we don't. We eat our own dog food and build everything on Raspberry Pi. So they're natively compiled on Raspberry Pi 3, um, just for compatibility and, and ensuring that um, we know that they'll work. We use a cloud service provided by a company called Mythic Beasts. Uh, they actually sponsor the project and give us uh, access to these these uh, Raspberry Pi servers. But you can uh, they do Raspberry Pi 3 and Raspberry Pi servers in a in a in a Pi cloud. So we use that. Uh, the stack is made up of obviously a bunch of different Pies doing different things. Uh, so we have a, a sort of main Pi that um, distributes the jobs and works out what's going on, distributes jobs to the builders, which 
compile all the, all the, um, the packages that they're told to, to build. And we've got a few for each of the different um, operating system distribution versions that we support. Uh, the Postgres database we used to be on a Pi, but we moved back to a VM. Basically, the way it works is you build for um, the, your lowest ABI, uh, and then if it fails, you move on to the next one. If it passes, you, know, uh, you either rebuild, or, or if you've got a compatible wheel that works on all, you, you, you can uh, finish there. Raspbian is pre-configured to use PyWorlds.org as an additional index, so people don't need to know about PyWorlds. They, they can just use it. Um, so everyone just gets this for free and don't, doesn't need to know how it works or anything. So if you pip install sci-fi, you, um, you get a wheel from pywheels.org. Uh, that's what the simple index looks like. That's what a uh, pro package page looks like. So you can read about the pro packages available. Uh, it saves people a bunch of time. We had about 9 million downloads uh, in 2019 and saved people 128 years in total. Uh, so find out more about uh, PyWheels at PyWheels.org. Uh, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So next one is uh, Luis. So let me know when you're ready. I'm going to start your timer. Luis, can you? Yeah, yeah, let me let me just um, share my screen. I'm trying to find the keynote. Yes, sharing my screen. Um, can you? Oh, God. God, 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 I think I need to allow. Can you, can you see the keynote or? No. No. I, um, I can move to the next one if you want and you can fix that. So, um, Vinicius, are you ready? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, thanks. That'd be great. Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. That's okay. So, Vinicius, I think you're mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Great. Okay. Hear me now. Okay, go. Hit it. Let's see. Okay, uh, I'll be talking now about the uh, PyBR I18N project which has the objective to bring Python for people in Brazil who doesn't speak English. My name, uh, my name for those who, not, who do not know me is Vinicius Gubiani Ferreira. And this story started a little bit about a year ago when I went to Python Brazil last year. That's me in the audience looking at several talks. And among these talks, I saw this one where they were recruiting volunteers for this project. I took a photo and decided to check it out later when I arrived at home. Uh, over there, the first contact I had with uh, some of the organizers of the project, the volunteers, uh, were through GitHub issues. And uh, I quite didn't know how to start. I asked for help on to what needs to be done, what needs to be translated. After that, they direct me to a Telegram group, which is where I talked with them about uh, one at every three, four days to get the work done. And uh, the work itself, the translation for the Python documentation is made using Transifix. We're evolving into lots of steps. Some of the guys uh, are now making it possible to translate using your own mobile phone. You don't even need a computer itself directly when you are on a train, on a bus. Uh, I particularly use the computer because I feel more comfortable and there's a glossary and other features to help out. And uh, just after the year switched, even thought 2020 is not being in such a good year, but at least this graph shows it is for the translation for Portuguese, which is good. We are increasing our rate. Currently, Python documentation is about 30, 30% 30 or the something percent translated for Portuguese. But it's a tough battle because new docs come in and we don't have enough people to help us translate. Uh, not everybody works uh, on a daily basis or long hours during the weekend. So I know there are several Brazilians over here in the conference. If anybody speaks Portuguese and wants to join the fight, Please talk with me after this talk. Hopefully I will get to the last slide with my contacts. And uh, 
some of my buddies ask me, why do we do all this volunteer work since I don't get any money at all in tweet, any fame, nothing at all. And I sent to them uh, with uh, the perks I got after this, I was able to join the Python Software Foundation as a contributing member, which include voting rights. Even thought I was too busy to vote, I'll admit it, but uh, I can vote every two years is the election. My name and all of the other volunteers are into the Python repository itself, the documentation. But uh, mostly important to engage with other people that want to make a change with open source and to pay for something that we borrowed from for free without paying not a dime. I wish I could donate for the Software Python Foundation, but uh, Brazilian highs is a sad currency. It, uh, if I convert to dollar, I'll be poor forever. So that's my way of helping with work. Uh, but most important in my view, that uh, project help others to learn and to inspire other people. One outcome that uh, from this project that uh, happened about two or three months ago, I guess, is which now the Python translation for Spanish is uh, in work. We hope to see it uh, on the official website as soon as possible. Uh, and some keynotes. It's very rewarding and fulfilling to work with open source doesn't have to be exhaustive and it's actually easier to participate than it actually looks. You don't have to work with cold code itself. Documentation is good. It helps other people. So as long as you feel you're doing a good job, then that's okay for you. Well, thanks again for the opportunity guys. And uh, any questions, look for me in this means or even on the Discord channel with this uh, alias slash nickname. Thank you, guys. There is a spring for the Python Spanish translation this weekend. So, Luis, I think you are back. Yeah. Let's try now. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thanks so much for, for being uh, reactive like you were. And let's try it now. Um, I think I can share my... My screen this time. So can can you see the the slides all good? Yeah, I can see them. Perfect. So um, as you can see, I, I had not shared my screen before in Zoom, but uh, but yeah, thanks for being right like that. So I'm a I'm a machine learning engineer working in NLP projects uh, in Berlin, and that's where I'm calling from, and that's a nice uh, stadium. And uh, today I want just to share my excitement about the. Um, the Python ecosystem at large, like we, we're not going to have time to go into the, the NLP specifically much, but uh, rather I, I will take you along with me on, in an overview of the life cycle of the project and try to give a shout out and highlight all the great open source libraries that help me like doing my job as a, as a machine learning engineer. So the first thing you need to do, uh, you probably heard about that, um, is that, um, you know, <laughs> if, if, if someone asks you what you're doing as a data scientist or machine learning engineer, chances are you're building data sets, right? So um, there are the two libraries um, that I want to give a shout out to are, uh, first off, Apache Airflow. Um, I use that to orchestrate my PNS um, function as a service ETL. Uh, they have a great uh, 2.0 release coming up and the, the team there is really, really hard at work. It's really, really cool. Um, the second one is DBT. Um, it uses Python and Jinja, uh, so templated SQL. And that allowed me to take the SQL out of my application code and build clean data sets. And you can also unload them to S3, uh, which actually um, allowed me to take some code out of Airflow and, and, and make things a bit, a bit cleaner and, and keep the data sets on, on the, the SQL side. Once you've built your, your data sets, um, you, you should first like, try to be the algorithm before, before anything. Um, and the first thing that I looked at there was to try to set up a human bench benchmark with some um, labeling tool. So there are many labeling tools out there. There is Prodigy, there are like many others. Uh, the point here is that I was trying to find something quick uh, without having to reinvent the wheel and re rebuild anything. So I found Docano, which is a, a Django-based um, labeling UI. Um, and the second thing I looked at was this library called Snorkel, which is uh, comes out of, uh, of Stanford and where you can basically use it to build a library of what's, what they call labeling functions. And as you build these labeling functions, you're gonna build up an understanding of your data sets 
and you're going to try to be that algorithm and, and improve it and that's going to be very good for uh, your project. Then you're going to um, work on the problem formulation and you can start with rules and then sadly here I have to say there is no library for that right so there is still a bit of work to be done uh, so you need to know about uh, in my case uh, name entity recognitions, entity linking, text classification etc uh, but there I would uh, point you to a great talk that was given at the RASA conference not too long ago uh, from one of the RASA engineers uh, that explains about their research process and basically there you rely on your uh, on your research process uh, within your team and as a as a teaser I would just say that um, uh, you know you should repaint even the old ones I'm not going to spoil anything I don't have time to go into it but basically my winning solution uh, relies on something that is quite old um, then you do the modeling there, uh, shout out to uh, like all the experiment tracking uh, libraries, like for example, MLflow. It helped me to structure my process and also to communicate to stakeholders uh, because the, the cost of, of modeling scales not linearly. Basically, you can get stuck for a while and having a benchmark and presenting it like this with a tool like this is very good. Uh, then, of course, uh, the old side, side scientific Python ecosystem. Um, and of course, Spacey, people have already spoken about Spacey. And again, there was a great talk from uh, one of the co-founders of Spacey at the Atraza conference. So I, I point you towards it. Um, lastly, you need to serve your model to the users. So there, I, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, uh, learning about fast API, which allowed me to, to build a, a backend endpoint uh, leveraging Pydantic types. Um, I, one thing that I found useful was also to, to, uh, to prototype an applet to quickly show, um, show my model to the product managers and to the other, um, to the other uh, stakeholders. The funny thing here, though, is that they use WebSockets and this kind of complicated my life a lot. Um, and just also shout out to, the, to Altair for being a great visualization uh, library. And so um, back to the point of these WebSockets, I ended up rebuilding the, the, the web app the old way sort of with just Tinja templates and the fast API um, endpoint. And, um, and yeah, I just wish that there was some kind of uh, Python library that gives you the, 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 the streaming experience of scripting your front end, but more with the WSGI and ASGI uh, style of, of fast API. Um, so that's it. That's just a quick overview of the, of the, of the end results. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, okay, that's the time. So, next one, BI. Okay, so please unmute yourself, share your screen. Uh, yeah, thank you. Welcome. So, you have five minutes starting now. Uh, okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, myself, Vijay Kumar. I'm a teacher and I brag about these two monuments. This is our uh, Gol Gumbaj, second largest monument in the world. This is our uh, Lord Shiva, second largest statue in India. And these are in my city, Bijapur. So anytime in India, please do a visit. And uh, regarding uh, this lightning talk, as I'm a teacher, I find it hard to convince the students that Python is really necessary for hardware. So this is where I keep uh, finding some interesting projects. In this talk, I will uh, try to simulate. Uh, I'm not sure whether I can share my computer audio. If it's possible, then we'll uh, listen to some music. We'll uh, take the music. We'll uh, use Librosa Python package and uh, use PyCD. I have this hardware connected with wire and uh, we'll uh, blink some LEDs. Okay. For that uh, blinking of LED, we are using the ESP8266 microcontroller through Arduino platform. So just in case I have the code for backup, I'll try to show the code run. Uh, let me see how can I share my computer audio. Yeah, it's here. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, up and running, I guess. So this is our Python package. We'll use uh, IPython display. I have a sample music of uh, just one second, one second or more. 
okay so this is recorded we can change the sampling rate and uh, play it slowly similarly i can uh, increase the tempo same music we are hearing in uh, different ways this libro site has a built in function where you can track the beats and uh, find the clicks where they should be added so once we listen we'll have a better idea so this is how we are going to add clicks to the music just for comparison sake i'll play once again original music after finding the tempo we are adding the clicks uh, some analysis how to do and all uh, i will share the code later so this is my web page for any queries or getting the code you can visit that page and again uh, just for enjoyment i have this another uh, music file uh, i don't try to judge me by these music uh, samples i just quickly grab whatever i can find on my computer okay a collab uh, takes a bit of time once we have this we'll add uh, clicks uh, let me see whether this is already there uh, about the music once i have the values i need to compile the sampling rate number of seconds uh, sorry length of the music file then add uh, beats to it along with this i will uh, move on to the python package called the pi serial we'll import it sorry sorry my nephew yeah. so we'll use the serial i don't need this okay and uh, using the com port i'll uh, serially write the values which will in way communicate to this arduino code and uh, arduino code which is already dumped here will uh, provide the lightings It means based on the beats and clicks we are going to develop the lightings i'll just quickly run this yeah so along with the music we'll play this Thank you. 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 That was uh, super cool. And doing a demo, live demo in a learning talk, I think is a two x uh, price. It's like yeah, actually, the sprint started brave. early for me. <laughs> you are brave. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Ross, you are next. Sure, I'll just share my screen. I'm going to struggle to compete with Librosa, but I will do my best. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Strong competition. Uh, so let me see if I can screen record here. So I'm doing this from my tablet, so it's going to be a little awkward to begin with. Uh, but I'm hoping you guys should see a blue slide coming up now. Yes. Yes. So you can. Yeah, a bit of minutes. delay. Five minutes, lovely, I'll crack on. So this is gonna to touch again on the open source contributions and giving back to Python, ultimately since we use it for free. So there's a bit of a running theme here. Uh, I am dialing in today from Edinburgh in Scotland, which is eerily quiet given the circumstances. Usually at this time of year, there'll be a lot of people visiting and it'd be nice to see the city booming again with more tourism as things slowly return to normal. So working here in Edinburgh, I'm quite heavy on Python, but also on Amazon Web Services, working for a company called People's Postcode Lottery. And while I was doing some testing for some of our Python work, I was doing a bit of work around HTTP responses and requests. And it came to my attention in the HTTP library that status code 418 is missing. Now, for those that don't know status code 418, it is I'm a teapot, whereby a server is going to respond saying, I am refusing to brew coffee because I am in fact a teapot. 
Now, this was part of an April Fool's joke back in 1998 for something called the Hypertext Copypot Control Protocol. Now, clearly, this isn't intended to be seriously used in any live system, but if it is, kudos to whoever's doing that. From my perspective, I, I was surprised to find it was missing. I thought that was an officially recognized code, but looking into it a little further, I, I learned this is a somewhat contentious issue. Some languages like Golang were supporting it already. We have sources like Mozilla that already support it, but then others like the IANA, which was not. And looking at previous Python contributions, it seemed that most people were following IANA's approach. And so thereby, that is why 418 was missing from the supported codes. So thinking it was rather scandalous it wasn't supporting this, I decided, why not add it myself? Python's open source and the CPython repository, the, one of the core parts of the foundation's uh, software is sitting in GitHub, free for people to contribute if they so wish and have that reviewed. So I decided to give this a whirl, this being my first open source experience personally. And so I just want to touch on that lightly for a few minutes. So first of all, I think it was quite an easy experience. Uh, there was great documentation out there explaining how to go about setting yourself up locally with your builds and your tests. Now, whilst that initially took a little time to spin up, once you had done it one time, it was a relatively succinct process going forward. And the quality of feedback coming back from the viewers was top notch. I, I was very impressed with the feedback, usually with examples, which would help me improve any patches that the, my peers were suggesting could be better. And it's certainly some of the best quality feedback I've had now in my few years of doing software development. So good work from, from that front for everyone that participated and helped out. Uh, the only downside, which isn't so much a criticism, but something just to for people to bear in mind if they decide to contribute themselves is it can be quite a slow process, unless of course it's an urgent bug fix of some form. It, it can be a long turnaround time between addressing feedback and then waiting for further reviews or approvals. And now simply this is because people are giving up their own time. That makes sense. It would be unreasonable and unfair, I think, to expect any quicker. But nonetheless, with that aside, it was a tremendous experience, that being my first open source one. And I am happy to announce that in March, this pull request, albeit a very small one, was merged. And it was a great first contribution from my perspective towards Python as a programming language and certainly many. And really what I'm wanting to drive home here is not so much the HTTP teapot status code, whilst I'm very proud of this, it's more to tell people if you haven't contributed to an open source project before and want to give it a whirl, I would highly recommend it. It's been a great experience and I'm sure Python would very much appreciate that. I've left some contact details at the bottom for Medium and LinkedIn. Most of my blog posts are about AWS, but there is some Python in there as well. And I'm happy for anyone to reach out to me uh, during conference or on these channels for a further chat. Cheers. Okay, thank you. Bravo. Okay, so next one is uh, Jill. Um, there is a space for more lightning talks. So I'm going to cheat and I'm going to sign for a lightning talk. So if anyone is brave enough to do that, uh, we have uh, we have time for it. Um, so, Jill, are you ready? Uh, can I start? Uh, can you see my terminal? I can see your terminal. So you awesome. have five minutes. Go. Great. So this is the story of how I solved a problem that didn't exist. I don't think it still exists. Um, let's say you're playing a tabletop game, right? How do you how do you throw a dice in in Python? You do from random import rendent. And then from rendent, we have a one to six and we're just rolling dice, right? Just calling the function, a random number from one to six. Uh, and what if we want to throw lots of dice, right? So we have, we, we can do a list comprehension, do rendent one to six again for D in range of six. And this gives us six dice. Um, now this is boring, right? Like it's, uh, I, I thought that I thought that Python was an object-oriented programming language, right? So why not use objects? Now Dragon gives you objects. So how does Dragon give you objects? So Dragon, and the people who know about Dungeons and Dragons will know what D6 means. It's a die. It's a die with six sides. 
So because this is an object, we have to call it. And when we call it, it rolls. What if you want to roll six dice? So this is where it shines. You just want to roll six dice, right? Then we call over and over. Um, so yeah, if you want to play board games or Dungeons and Dragons, pip install Dragon. Thank you. That's literally it. I don't need more than five minutes. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> so, Thank you. Okay, so that was the last in the program, but I was cheating because we have time, so I signed it for one. Chuck is pushing me to do some karaoke talks. So I will do two things. Um, sorry for the Euro Python organization. This conference has a really nice schedule. I am breaking it. So but we have time until six. That is uh, it's going to be in our Seller keynote. So first I'm going to give a lightning talk, five minutes, but then if anyone wants to do karaoke talks. Karaoke talks is, you, decide, you say, I want to do that. Then I share my screen. I Google for a random word, like slides, sharks, and I open the slides and I start playing the slides and the person has to give a talk about that. So if anyone wants to do that, tag me in the Discord channel and we can do one or two of those. And if we like the idea, we are planning to do that tomorrow night until we, after drinking probably, or that kind of things. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen and someone has to, um, to so can you see a GitHub repo here? Yep. Maybe, okay. So, this year we have the remote Python Pizza conference, a Vinicius that was talking here about the Python Brazil translation, was talking, giving a similar talk to the, a longer version than this one. And in that conference, we started saying, okay, you know, this is a good idea. We are, I'm, I'm part of the Python Argentina community. This is my teacher for PyConR 2019. And we say, okay, we need to do that for the Spanish version. So that we should do that. That was, in May, or that was in April. So in May, 1st of May, we had the first meeting and we started working like quite hard. Um, we took uh, the Python tutorial that Python Argentina was maintaining for the last 14 or 12 years, I don't remember. And we migrated to the PO format that Python.org official documentation is using. And then we build a channel and we build a community and now, Right now we have a community that is around 100 persons in a Telegram channel working. We have this repo, as you can see, this is official Python repo. And I can go here and show you some numbers. So the past month we did like, uh, are, are you seeing my full screen or half of it? Because I have a green line there. So, okay, I don't know. Looks like the full so, one. Okay, so 50 pull request merge. 39 open, 29 closed issues, a lot of contributors. Uh, so, and now good news is that if you go to doc.python.org, you can click here and select Spanish. And it's official, we did it. So you can go to the tutorial and you have the official Python documentation in Spanish. Uh, and I think that's just awesome. That's just how the Python community awesome is. Uh, if you like this project and you want to participate, go to this repo and this weekend in the sprints, we are going to be working on it. So showing us there is a python.s channel. And next year in the PyCam, we are going to be also working there. If you don't know what PyCam is, I don't have time in this learning talk, but it's the best event, Python event in the world. You have to go there. It's next year in April in Barcelona. Okay, okay. So I have a bug by my stop. Can someone stop my share screen because I'm stuck here? <laughs> it it disappeared. So maybe one of the co-hosts can do that for me. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Zoom is not taking a lot of love with the Python client. Okay, so I'm going to check the Discord channel. <clears throat> Chuck wants to do karaoke. Who wants? Jason. Okay, we have two persons. Prados also. Okay, three. Um, the one that is not here, Jason, I'm going to promote you to panelists. This is new. Catherine or San Jose also. And honestly, I, I was actually, before the karaoke even got requested, I actually wanted to throw one in there, just a regular one, honestly, because I, I can actually do one. You want to do a lightning talk? Yeah, I just want to do a, do a lightning talk, yeah. I, I, I okay, go for it. All right, so okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start my video here. Let me start my screen share. I am completely uh, making this up as I, as I go along. So let me just uh, make a mess of my screen. So... Can, 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 everyone, can everyone see my, machine, my, my screen? Yeah. All right, cool. So uh, basically, there was a problem that um, I noticed uh, tends to exist in the uh, world of computer uh, project management, programming uh, management, uh, and that is that we have this uh, thing in our issue trackers where we have, okay, we have high priority, we have low priority. Problem is those priorities are constantly changing. So um, the reason I brought this up is the official form of this, but I wrote a much more fun article in Dev about this. But I invented a system called Quantified Task Management that just makes it a lot uh, simpler to um, prioritize tasks. Uh, so basically, there's four different ways you have of measuring it. You start out by coming up with the gravity. While you're coming up with your requirements, you, you figure out the gravity. All of these are on a scale of zero to five, zero being not at all, five being critical. And so you figure out what are the critical features of your program? What are the things you cannot ship without? Those are your G5s. You keep those fairly limited. And then G4 is the stuff that kind of adds, improves on that. You only cut it if you're desperate. Uh, G3 is, is like polishing tasks, the most important bells and whistles. And it just goes down in terms of priority. You set the gravity once initially. And you can even use these as story points if you like doing agile methodology. Um, and then uh, from there, so that stays fixed, and then you have your priorities. And the nice thing about having these separate is that you could have something that needs to be done right now, but may not be a critical task, because your critical task needs six other pieces, and so you can't get to that high gravity task yet, so it's a low priority. So it lets you keep these two things separate. Um, so priority, again, is uh, zero to five, but we reserve five for my hair is on fire type of events. So P4 is your usual, I'm working on this right now. Um, and then there's two other measures I threw in here. Um, briefly, friction is fun because this is a measure of difficulty based on the resources available to you. Uh, F0 for, uh, this is, you can basically copy and pass, paste from Stack Overflow for this, all the way up to F5, probably never been done before and may require esoteric knowledge of two or three languages and possible skill in Demogorgon. And then uh, the relativity um, uh, is the probability, uh, the black hole probability, when your boss says, hey, how long is this going to take? And you lie and you say two weeks. You can stick a relativity score on that and say, you know what, two weeks or three. There's a good possibility I'm not going to get this done. So this goes all the way from zero. This is deterministic time. It's definitely going to take exactly two weeks. There's no way it's going to take any more time. All the way up to R5, it will take more time than in the no known universe. And we need to refactor this. Uh, by adding these, and these you can add these easily into any bugs, uh, bug or issue tracker, you add all of these in there and it becomes really easy to uh, track your progress, track your productivity, um, and just generally keep yourself from going completely crazy. So you can find all of this if you go to standards.mousepawmedia.com, uh, click on quantified task management, or you can even just type in quantified task management into your search engine. I've written a couple articles in dev about this as well, and it just makes... Uh, uh, tracking issues a whole lot easier. I've been using it for a couple of years now. So that's, uh, that's mine. Hello, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let us do this signing for learning talk now. I really like how I'm creating some out of program, out of scale things. So the next one is where are you? Binayak, I found you. So, you ready? Please share, share your screen. Yeah. Turn on your camera, open your microphone. Can you see me? Let me just share my screen. I can see you, yes. 
Uh, can you see my screen and a terminal? Uh, I can see your terminal and you have five minutes. Yeah. So this light and talk is about a feeling of fear and a fear of missing out that I got last year when I was applying to a lot of conferences, uh, like just tracking CFPs and just uh, uh, like being overwhelmed by the fact that there are so many different websites where you have to go and like look at conferences if you want to track them. So uh, this is something that I built uh, to fix that. It is called Conference Radar or Conrad for short. It is like a CLI tool which, uh, which can help you track conferences on your terminal. So if I just do a Conrad show, oh, let me just, yeah. So it'll show all the conferences that are happening this year uh, in a nice table format. And Conrad show also has uh, a lot of filters. For example, I can do location, India. It'll show me Python India. And similarly, if I do name, Euro, it'll show me Euro Python, Euro Sci-Fi, Django Kong. And I can also set reminders for each of these conferences. For example, um, each conference has an ID. So if I do a Conrad remind hyphen I some ID, it'll set a reminder for that. And I've added that to my shell startup file. So every time I open a shell, I see a reminder for CFPs and conference start dates. And there, there's a, basically a lot of different filters that you can use to query the conference database. For example, I can also search web tags. These are all the Python conferences happening this year. And if I want to refresh the conference database, I'll just do a convert, uh, Conrad refresh, do a yes. And it'll refresh the database to give you the latest conferences. So on the back end, how it works is that it's just using a GitHub action to um, scrape all of these sources and uh, basically condense them into this one JSON file, which is in this repo. And then the CLI tool, tool calls uh, that endpoint to get the JSON file and show you all of these on and it runs Monday and Mondays and Thursdays two times a week. Right now it doesn't work for paper call, but um, it works for all of these other sources. And if you want to add, if you want me to add more sources, just open an issue or you can uh, also do that yourself by just looking at the documentation of adding a crawler. So you just have to import a base class and write a crawler for uh, the website that you want to scrape and create a list and that'll, it's uh, that easy. And I just added pyjamas conf to a source that I'm tracking and it got merged. So you can also set reminders for, a reminder for pyjamas conf, uh, which is going to happen in December this year. And that's mostly it. Thank you. Hey, hey.